Let's uh, rip from the headlines. Uh, definitely something getting a lot of uh, attention uh, in the press these days with regards to shortages, in particular, baby formula. Uh, the headline from the Associated Press last week, parents hunting for baby formula as shortage spans U.S. Parents across the U.S. are scrambling to find baby formula because supply disruptions and a massive safety recall have swept many leading brands off store shelves. Months of spot shortages at pharmacies and supermarkets have been exacerbated by the recall at Abbott, which was forced to shutter its largest U.S. formula manufacturing plant in February due to contamination concerns. On Monday, White House Secretary Jeff Psaki said the Food and Drug Administration was working around the clock to address any possible shortages. On Tuesday, the FDA said it was working with US manufacturers to increase their output and streamlining paperwork to allow more imports. For now, pediatricians and health workers are urging parents who can't find formula to contact food banks or doctor's offices. They warn against watering down formula to stretch supplies or using online do-it-yourself recipes. Trying to keep formula in stock, uh, retailers, including CVS and Walgreens, have begun limiting purchases to three containers per customer. Baby formula is particularly vulnerable to disruption because just a handful of companies account for almost the entire U.S. supply. Industry executives say the constraints began last year as the COVID-19 pandemic led to disruptions in ingredients, labor, and transportation. Supplies were further squeezed by parents stockpiling during lockdown. So, uh, so, of course, this headline is from a week ago, a number of different changes. Recently, uh, there was uh, the, the effort to bring in more from uh, other countries to import and cut through some of the red tape involved. And that was uh, announced yesterday. But uh, you know, this is not uh, the first time we're encountering uh, difficulty in uh, procuring items, uh, you know, especially in the early days of COVID, toilet paper, paper towels, uh, you know, we're certainly familiar with uh, people uh, stockpiling or hoarding uh, when they're worried about something uh, not being available. Uh, it's kind of it's human nature, um, but uh, you know th th this case in particular has uh, you know, captured the attention because you know everybody who has children who need formula need formula, and therefore this is something that impacts anyone who has a child who needs formula. There's no Workarounds. There's no, the, 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 you know, rich and poor alike. Everybody, everywhere, uh, is going to encounter uh, this situation. And uh, you know, uh, hopefully, as with the other shortages and supply chain issues, uh, we'll find uh, this. As it says, this too shall pass. Um, but I think it's helpful. You know, take a look at what are some of the Jewish sources we have with regards to. Um, Stockpiling to 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 what a, to, to price gouging, you know things of that sort. You know it's it's kind of all of a sudden formula is a hot commodity. You know just like with scalping tickets, I'm sure people will do what they can to try and uh, you know turn a profit on this. That's kind of the human economic nature. Just uh, before we jump into the the Jewish sources, any reactions, thoughts, uh, personal uh, experiences on the subject. Okay, so um, you know, I, there, there, I was in addition to showing the, in addition to showing uh, the the headline, I was going to, uh, you know, uh, to, to to show a uh, clip, you know, from uh, you know our, our favorite uh, our favorite uh, comedian Larry David uh, from uh, Curb Your Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, season eleven episode one about the COVID hoarder. Um, it's a little early in the morning to, uh, for that kind of salty language. Feel free to uh, Google it and uh, look at it yourselves. But uh, you know this this kind of the the uh, the outrage when people take advantage uh, uh, of this and are you know uh, are found to be the ones, whether it be withholding the product or hoarding the product. And uh, I leave it for your uh, personal uh, perusal and entertainment. So the, the Talmud actually does have. Uh, a, 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 a recognition of this type of a scenario. It's actually somewhat timely with regards to the, the Shemitah year that we're in, the sabbatical year that we have in Israel, because you know, the, the idea that there's no produce of the seventh year, which can be uh, regularly uh, harvested and sold and you know, definitely um, 
creates difficulties for the supply chain meant that this was something that Jewish law encountered, in particular, it encountered it with regards to, um, you know, what can be, uh, uh, what can, what can one stock up on in advance of the Shemitah year. Uh, in, in addition, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, the, the, the Talmudic Judaism, Judaism in general, ancient times were not immune to shortages, to floods, to famines, uh, and the like. So the Talmud of Baba Basra deals with the following situation, source number one. Rob says, a person may turn his own kav into a storeroom, right? He's able to take his own material, the stuff that he uh, himself grows. He may hoard the produce of his own field and sell it only at a later stage without violating the prohibition of hoarding produce, right? If you have access to a specific product that's yours, you're the farmer, you have a kav, that's the measure of on the field, you're certainly allowed to keep that for yourself. It's yours to begin with. There's nothing wrong in holding it for later use. This is also taught in a Brita, a supporting text. One may not hoard produce of items that contain an element of basic sustenance, such as wines, oils, and flowers. But in the case of spices, such as cumin and pepper, it is permitted, right? The idea that if, there's a, if there are staples that people need, you're not allowed to hoard them. If they're luxury items, uh, you're allowed to hold on to them more. What case is the statement said? Regard to one who buys that product of the market to resell later, right? You're not allowed to hoard, you're not allowed to buy products and hoard them. But with regard to one who brings in produce from his own field, it is permitted for any type of produce. So this is the teaching that's supporting the initial statement of Rav, that if you have something, you're allowed to hold on to it. But if there's something, uh, if there's a shortage, you're not allowed to purchase more than you need and hoard on to it. That's, you're not allowed to hold on to it for, to resell later, right? And, and the Rashbam, Rashbam is the uh, grandson of Rashi. Uh, the Gemara in Baba Basra doesn't have uh, uh, as much of a Rashi commentary as it does the Rashbam. And um, the Rashbam comments that, um, the, 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 that, you know, what's going on here? The, the, the you're, you're allowed, the, 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 the intent of the Talmudic teaching here is about you're allowed to protect your family, right? As the Rashbam says, That which God has given to him, you're allowed to keep. You're not allowed to not the ayin, but with an aleph. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to go to the store and buy out the entire stockpile and keep it for yourself. You're certainly allowed to support your family. You're allowed to, it's really about family protection. So if you have a product, you can maintain it for the family. You're allowed to buy during times of shortage. You're not allowed to stock, you're not allowed to hoard, but you're always allowed to take care of your family. That was the, 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 the first teaching in Baba Batra 90B. And the Talmud continues, with a discussion, uh, as we, we prefaced before, the idea of a, of a Shemitah year. Um, because remember, there's no, nothing really growing the seventh year, then you have to wait to the eighth year. And you know, Shemitah, which is timely, it's uh, de definitely it's uh, our weekly Parsha that we're reading uh, this Shabbos, Parshas Bahar, talks about Shemitah. You know, that created a, a, a tremendous strain and stress on farmers. and. Uh, maybe something we'll talk about uh, in an upcoming uh, class about sh present day Shemitah. Uh, source number three is permitted for a person to for a person to ho hoard produce in Eretz Yisrael for these three years: the year preceding the sabbatical year, the sabbatical year, and the year that follows the sabbatical year. Because the land lies fallow during the seventh year, the sabbatical year, and the produce of the sixth must last through these three years until the end of the eighth year. Okay, so we, we, there's a there, 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 there's permissible hoarding because of the fact there's going to be a shortage. Again, the rules that we saw earlier would apply if it's yours. And in years of drought, one may not hoard even a cob of caribs because he thereby brings a curse on the market prices. As everyone is fearful of selling and even a small fluctuation in supply can cause a significant price, rise in prices. Right, if it's a difficult year, if there's a shortage because of a drought, you can't hoard because hoarding is going to impact, um, it's going to impact uh, the prices. It's going to lead to price gouging, the prices will go up. Everyone is fearful. Uh, and therefore one is not allowed to take advantage of that situation. Now, 
the uh, Rashbam here uh, has a comment, and it's a comment that's not uh, based on any specific language that we just read. This is a little bit of a, a of a parallel idea that usually, you know, Rashi or Rashbam will comment on the text or the language of the Gemara. Sometimes Rashi or Rashbam has a different version of the Gemara in front of them. And it's called in Aram, it's called in Aramaic the Girsa. The the specific text that they have has uh, can be sometimes be different. In this case, the Rashbam seems to have a different text of the tractate Bava Batra than we're using. And he makes a comment that's going to kind of open up the, the, the discussion that this is uh, on the one hand. Obviously, you have to do what is right, but what we're believing a little ambiguity about what is right. So the Rashbam here in source number four says, "Umir Yishayer la'atzmo kedei hotzaso l'shana." You know, when it, when it talked about the, the Rashbam, uh, when it talked about the year of drought, when it talked about hoarding, you know, when you're not allowed to hoard, the Rashbam says you're allowed to hold on to for oneself whatever you'll need for the whole year. And that's a little bit different. You know, so the Talmud that we just read talked about you're not allowed to hoard at all because of the curse on market prices. Because you know, if you start hoarding, there'll be a shortage for other people to impact the prices. The Rashbam seems to feel that it's not considered hoarding uh, if you want to stockpile the product for a year. Now, you know, we're talking about baby formula, that could be a lot of cans. Um, you know, we, we'll also have to revisit the idea of you know, whether the Talmud uh, ha, 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 is talking about a certain objective maximum purchase, you know, ver, or not, you know, or, or what the products are. But it seems that what emerges from the Talmud is the Talmud is concerned about hoarding. The Talmud does respect the ownership rights of the farmer to hold on to his product and not sell it if he's concerned about not having enough. The Talmud is concerned about the consumer buying too much of a, of a product that uh, may be scarce because of what that does uh, to the market um, uh, and what that does to the overall confidence of the consumers and everything. Uh, and we have to try and understand but how much is a person allowed to hold on for their own personal needs? And so far, the only source we've seen is that you can always have on hand a year's worth of product. Now, having on hand a year's worth of product is probably not something that many of us think of all that often. Um, you know, you know, COVID toilet paper aside, right? We don't generally stock up on things a year in advance, um, and we'll have to, and, and we'll see if that plays out in the way that this is applied uh, in Jewish law. So the Talmud is concerned about hoarding. The Talmud wants people, both the, uh, the, 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 the both the, the, the producer uh, to behave appropriately and the consumer to behave appropriately, recognizing that each has to look after their own, but should not do anything that would. Uh, uh, that, that, that would negatively impact uh, other people, whether it be through the prices or the market conditions. That's the Talmud's presentation from Bava Batra. Questions, comments, or reactions before we look at how uh, this was applied in Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, and you know, practically speaking. Okay, so this is the Talmud's presentation. And this is codified in Jewish law, source number five. One may not hoard essential fruits in Israel or any place which has a majority of Jews. When is this the case? When purchasing the items from the market. But one may hoard that which grows in one's field. During a famine, one may only hoard enough for one's family, own family to last a year. So it seems to essentially adopt the conclusions uh, as conclusions, what we saw in the Talmud. Also referencing the Rashbam's uh, text, which is that we're all, uh, you're allowed to stock up for an entire year. And um, you, you, you can't uh, impact other people or, or the marketplace, but you can certainly hold on to your own, uh, your own goods. The Aruch HaShulchan, I just, you know, a note once again, Shulchan Aruch is the code of Jewish law, Rabbi Yosef Cairo. The Aruch HaShulchan, right, the Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch is the, the set table. The Aruch HaShulchan is the setting of the table. And this is Rabbi Achil Michal Epstein, a, a community rabbi in uh, Navardak uh, in the turn of the 20th century. And he took the decisions of the Shulchan Aruch and expanded upon them uh, and uh, also included community practice and the like. Uh, in, in a sense, it's kind of we, we, we're going around and around. 
before there was a code of Jewish law, people had to study the Talmud. If there's no code, you have to go back to the sources. That's a lot of Talmud to study to find certain laws, especially when laws can sometimes be based on multiple tractates. So the idea of a code of Jewish law, whether it be Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Fasi in Morocco in the 11th century, or whether it be Maimonides in the 12th century, or the code of Shulchan Aruch in the 16th century, these were all efforts to codify Jewish law and provide one place to look. Rabbi Epstein saw this and felt, well, wait a second, if all you have is the law, then you're, you're missing out on how the law developed as well as some of the alternate opinions and to, to provide a richer overview of the law, he went and expanded upon it, including some of those earlier sources, uh, which the Shulchan Aruch left out. So it's the, essentially, it's the same order of laws throughout the Shulchan Aruch, but the Aruch HaShulchan will both open it up and help us explain how the decision came about, as well as sometimes including some of the way it has been implemented in practice from the last 300 years since the Shulchan Aruch to his own time. So the Aruch HaShulchan is describing, you know, when is this uh, a problem of hoarding? Right, you're not allowed to buy from the you know, buy from the marketplace. Um, you can keep what you can hoard, what you grow. You also you notice it's in the parentheses says Rashbam, and to support your family, you can buy what you need from the market. And if, if it's a time of uh, famine or um, drought, you're not allowed to take more than you need for a year. So again, it seems to indicate that, that you, can, you can hoard enough for a year. Right? Why? Right? Because, you, because, you know, it seems that, you know, for a year, a, a, a year's amount is something that... Uh, you know, is it, it, something that, um, um, you know, it, it, because it's a reasonable amount to store things, right? In general, if there's no shortage of, of supplies, then you can certainly collect and hoard for multiple years, right? So there, there seems to be an, an assumption that some of these products that we're talking about hoarding are things which have a lot of uh, a lot of significant shelf life. At least in the perspective of uh, you know Rabbi Chil Michal Epstein in the Aruch Hashulchan, right? He's worried about hoarding. He seems to it seems to be practice that you can. It's reasonable to buy. Uh, it seems like everyone's you know buying enough of something for a, a year, um, but you know, and that's why a year is considered a year is considered uh, almost minimizing one's purchases. If you buy just for a year, you haven't. If you buy just for a year, you're not really buying that much because some things you'll buy to keep stock of for multiple years. And when you, you know, you, when you see, when you read like that, if you read the Aruch HaShulchan talking about purchasing enough of a particular product to last for multiple years and during uh, difficult uh, times uh, where there's a shortage, you can only buy for one year, you know, you have to imagine what this looks like, right? You know, I don't know where everyone here shops but you know, you go to Costco, you you, you fill up a you, you you fill up a shopping cart. You're going back, a, you know, a month later, you know. So where are these guys shopping that you're picking up, you know, supplies for multiple years at a time? However, it's the different different products available, different uh, supplies. You know, I guess I kind of like the only thing that uh, you know that, that that comes to mind that you're kind of storing for multiple years. You know, maybe it's because we just celebrated Pesach Sheni. It's a Pesach product that I'm thinking of, and it's not matzah. Shlivovitz. Okay. No, Shlivovitz is it's that you know that uh, that uh, alcoholic uh, plum brandy type of beverage out of Yugoslavia, right? If you buy it new or you try it 21 years old, it tastes the exact same. You know, so maybe that's the type of a product that we're talking about in terms of hoarding, and, and you're going to stock up for for a long time. But you know, all kidding aside, the Aruch Hashulchan seems to be describing a scenario that might not be as familiar to us. You know, in terms of, you know, what would the, um, you know, if, for example, if people normally only purchase a week, a month at a time, you know, maybe the Aruch HaShulchan is talking about, you can usually, people usually stock up. But in times of shortage, you can uh, stock up for just a year. Well, maybe the just a year in the Aruch HaShulchan's time is just a week or just a month uh, in, in 21st century shopping, uh, sh shopping uh, parlance. So it's, um, you know, the, the idea that, 
the idea of what we're what we're picking up uh, and what we're, how much we're allowed to, it seems to be a little bit uh, dependent on you know what's what's uh, what's reasonable and what's or, or what's usual, what's commonplace. Um, but overall, it remains you, 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 in times of shortage, you're not supposed to hoard more than you need for your family for a and you should not buy the same amounts that you normally buy. You should buy less, but enough that gives you an immediate need, but you shouldn't be trying to you know, plan ahead. That seems to emerge from the Archa Shulchan's understanding of, of these sources and trying to take the Talmud's more agrarian society and the shopping habits of the previous centuries into at least the turn of the 20th century. Uh, questions or comments? Rabbi, I need some advice. Can you hear me? Baby, you, know, you need to buy baby formula? Yes, no, uh, seriously, it's a serious question. Yeah. Gas, I, I see gasoline prices are going higher and higher very rapidly. I want to hoard gasoline. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a suggestion uh, how I can do that? Because I Well, that, 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 everyone's always says to, to, to shop, buy your gas at Costco where it's cheaper. Now, hoarding gasoline might not be the smartest thing because, you know, how are you going to hold it? And it's, it, it is kind of flammable, they say. So I'm not sure you want to you necessarily... You know, hold on to too much. But, I'm willing to take the risk of the inflammable. I want to. I want to keep it at current price. I think it's going. Uh, price is going to be going to ten dollars a gallon. Well, so, I, I, uh, I hope. I, wanna... I, I, I would say you know you know you know part of when you're asking the question now makes me think that you know but put it much we have to you know support policies that will allow for the optimal use of you know current uh, oil and gas supplies in America. I don't know. Maybe it's you know we maybe this is only settled at the ballot box. I don't know, but uh, th that's as political as I'll get. But only because you asked the question, well, and I know should, how apolitical I, you I are. I think we should mandate everybody driving Teslas. Okay, oh, either I was I thought you maybe bicycles, but um, no, but 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 it's an example of a product. You know th that's an issue that's really much more of an economic yeah. issue. It doesn't we don't have like we had in the in the. Uh, you know, in the '70s, there's no, there's no, you know, gas lines of the the same way. Um, you know, you, you know, the, the, you know the, what we're talking about, at least, you know, is when there's really a shortage of a staple product. That you know, buying more of that means you're taking it out of the mouth of somebody else, and that's what we're concerned about. At the same time, and you know, just talk about taking, you know, obviously, you know, taking it out of someone's mouth for yourself, you know, is a certain is an instinct of self-preservation. It just it's interesting to note that the Shulchan Aruch uses the language about it, it depends if this is a place where there are a majority of Jews. And, you know, the, some of the commentaries picked up on, you know, what's going on here? Is this, you know, is this another example of where, you know, the, the Talmud and Jewish law really only focused on the Jews because Jews were only living amongst Jews and they didn't have any experience with non-Jews? Or is there something else over here? So um, the Meiri, Rabbi Menachem Meiri, uh, 13th century commentary on, uh, on the Talmud, points out that few th he says that this, all, any of these prohibitions or limitations of uh, hoarding uh, for essential products, uh, source number seven, lo nesru ela el be'eretz Yisrael o be'ir she'raba Yisrael, right? That, that this is only in Israel or in a Jewish majority place. There really are no laws here. This is not about stealing. This is not about, uh, a, 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 we, we can't be very specific. This is that thou shalt not steal. And this isn't even uh, a, a, about a, a legal attitude. This is midat chasidut. This is ethics. This is values. I, on some level, and you know, maybe we, you know, if we, 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 we revisit the sources that we've seen so far from, you know, from his perspective, you know, it's talking about you're allowed to hoard your own product, but you're not allowed to buy out the shelves in a store. He, you know, what, how can you hoard your own product if other people need something? And so the, the Meiri says that the, the fact that this is introduced to us, that this is a Jewish environment, or we're talking about mostly Jewish people who are the consumers uh, in, in this situation, or even the producers in this situation, is because in our own self-contained community, we can encourage each other to act properly, even if it's beyond the letter of the law. 
The Meir, the Meir feels that Jewish law doesn't mandate, dictate, obligate when it comes to these situations, but it is human nature that we're trying to bring out the best in human nature to do the right thing. And that's not so simple. Um, and therefore, um, you know, in a situation where the Jews are living amongst themselves, they're more, uh, you know, everyone is kind of responsible or accountable to one another, you should do the right thing. And you should therefore uh, not buy too much, not hoard too much. You should try and, and maintain the equilibrium and integrity of the supply chain or the marketplace as much as possible. But we can't force you. You know, we can only encourage you to do the right thing. It's it's kind of an extension of, uh, you know, the asita hayashar vato. Do what's right and good is repeated numerous times in the book of Devarim. It's not a mitzvah, but we expect the people to act uh, in the appropriate fashion. Similarly, the um, the, uh, the, the Archa Shochan also recognizes this because he talks about this being in the place at source number eight, not, not uh, hoarding essential items in Israel and in most places, in all places where there's majority Jews, because you don't want the price to go up. What about where there's non-Jews? And when there's mostly non-Jews, he said, look, if the Jews are in the minority and the non-Jews are setting the economic policy, they're not going to follow Jewish law. And so therefore, why should the Jews be at a disadvantage? If everyone else is hoarding, why shouldn't the Jews be able to hoard too? A kind of very uh, uh, real politic uh, type of an approach. Look, Jews are not supposed to hoard, but if everybody's hoarding, uh, why should the Jew be the one left holding an empty basket? And it's kind of a uh, you know, you know, a kind of a, you know, the Me'iri and the Orcha Shochan, I think, are sort of two sides of the same coin uh, in this type of a scenario. Jewish law tells us not to steal. Jewish law has certain uh, recommendations or approaches or uh, uh, aspirations for how this will play out, but it doesn't have a specific legal obligation. When we're all living in a, within a community where we are accountable to one another because it's being, you know, it's the, it's the you know, it's, it's a more closed Jewish community or we're in the overall majority, then you have to follow, then you should follow the aspirational value. But when we're not in charge and it's kind of every man for themselves, as the Archa Shochan points out, you know, how can we tell the Jews not to hoard if everybody else is as well? Uh, just to, to, sum, uh, to, to conclude the, the, the legal analysis of this uh, source number nine from Rabbi Dr. Itamar uh, you know, an Israeli rabbi uh, a, 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 and economist, the prohibition of hoarding is a means of combating price rises of essential items. The prohibition applies to the merchant to the consumer. The producer is not obligated to sell his product immediately. The consumer is permitted to stock up for home use. And there's a special suspension of the prohibition on the eve of the sabbatical year. Right? He's kind of, he's writing in you know, 21st century uh, summary of the, the subject that we've studied. During a time of shortages, such as drought, even hoarding for household use is forbidden because of the resulting difficulty to the needy. The private consumer, on the other hand, is apparently not prevented from buying as much as he can use even a year in advance. There are, however, two points to be considered. First, in ancient times, people did not shop frequently. It was quite normal to buy large amounts of basic items sufficient for several months. Today, when the housewife shops, you know, I guess in, in, his, in his house, the wife shop, but, or the husband. Several times a week, why should a consumer be permitted to hold, hoard a year's supply of oil? His motivation is not to ensure the availability in another month, but to profit. Really seeing this in, 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 in very much economic terms and also recognizing the fact that uh, we, we shop far more frequently and therefore maybe we have more responsibility not to hoard because product will be usually more readily available. Obviously in the case of a shortage, uh, even more so, we should buy what we need and not take more uh, in the hopes of uh, not, uh, uh, not other people not being able to, to get as well. Uh, questions, comments, reactions before we flip over to another maybe rubric of understanding that's not necessarily the financial, but from, a, from an ethical, moral perspective and some of the sources on that. Rabbi, it's Aviva. Hi. Hi. Um, a few questions. Uh, Yosef and mm -hmm. the lead years and the good years he hoarded and he hoarded for his community and and well then, that was that was that was his first off that was his produce right that he was he was collect it was the, the it was the government the government was holding on to its own exactly and, and, and but also not there was also no shortage they were they, they were keeping the excess 
They were planning on a short. Right. So okay. I, I see that more the that's more the rubric of F, you know, proper okay. product planning. So from what I know about the baby formula, thank God we had two a grandchild and a great grandchild born recently and my grandchild in California, all of a sudden my daughter calls me and she goes, Ma, I can't get formula. And I went searching all over and found some here and some there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but Abbott changed the size by government order of their cans to a smaller size to prevent portage. Mm -hmm. ridiculous. But the point is that they closed the plant and they didn't plan for something. The government didn't plan what, what they're going to do. So right. we're all what you react to is there may not be left. And then I'm going to go to Mun. So our natural tendency, I guess, is to take when you see it because it might not be there tomorrow. Right. And we right. were told by, by Hashem not to do that. You know, Shabbos, don't worry, there'll be again. Or take two, it won't rot. Or whatever the story is. Because it's our tendency to protect basic with basic needs to protect ourselves. So I'm like a little bit confused with all the commentaries because I don't know where the ones you chose because I don't think it covers any of that thinking. Well, I think a part of it, I think that the, uh, I think that the, the Meiri is capturing your point is that, you know, people, Jewish law does not mandate on things like this because human nature takes over. We can aspire to everybody. We can aspire to everything working out properly, whether it's the regulations working out properly and there's a whole conversation why they shut the plant and why they just do the recall of the product. And that's a separate issue. But aspirationally speaking, we hope that people will, will that, that both the market and the response to the individual will work out well. I think it's hoarding so as not to gouge as opposed to hoarding uh, to you. Correct. Well, I, look, I think that the, 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 I, because from a from a technical legal perspective, that you know, again, uh, looking through the eyes uh, of the Meiri, that's all that Jewish law has a mechanism of controlling, and even that mechanism of control is only when it is empowered to do so. And you know, once again, it therefore, uh, it, it therefore, you know, falls short of actual uh, maintaining the integrity of the marketplace because it doesn't have a it doesn't have a way of you know, it doesn't have a way of saying do this and don't do that. It's kind of, you know, the, 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 that you know, the, many are looking for when it comes to halachic behavior for specific do's and don'ts. That that, fall, that that definitely falls short here because human nature in, in, intervenes. And so the Meiri, I think, is trying to springboard this into a different discussion of proper behavior because there are a lot of things we can't control. The government regulations. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, as well as on the economic side, we should be doing the right thing. But how does that work in terms of hoarding? I think your your, your money example uh, precedent is is exactly the way people respond. Even when they know they'll have enough, uh, they still hoard because you know that's the, 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 that's you know the, the, there's always the concern is will that really be the case? You know, some would say that look, you know, they were right to to, to have that type of characteristic because. Then it was guaranteed by God. But what about a time when it's not? You need to be able to have, uh, you need to be able to survive when you don't have what you need. And the and press I, added to the fear mongering, of course. So, correct. You know, so I think that for, for me, you know, for, for, for me, the Meiri's comment that this is not law, but ethics, morals, values, as well as the Aruch HaShulchan recognizing the real politic of this all, that, you know, we're not going to tell Jews to be more, uh, to, 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 be, to be more sensitive than non-Jews who are hoarding means we should move this into a little bit of a different category. And the Shi'iltot of Rav Achaigo begins to create that category, which will lead us into, a, a, I think, the category of a, a, a meta value rather than just a specific law. The Shi'iltot, when it talks about this hoarding, and it's, it's similar to, to the Talmudic text, but says in times of famine, person may not utilize what he has saying, I will eat and drink as usual. Right, when this, you know, th th this dates back to also Yosef and, and Yaakov and the Midrash which says that yeah, Jacob had food, but instead he told his uh, sons to go down and get because he had to appear like everyone else as if he was also in need. Instead, he must be careful and struggle along with everyone else. The rabbi saw when the community is in trouble, an individual may not say, I'll eat and drink and I'll be all right. One who does this 
is visited by two angels who put their hands on the person's head and say, this person who's separated from the community will not see the consolation of the community. Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Rav, one who was hungry during years of famine is saved from an unusual death as a reward for casting his lot with the community. This idea that, the, 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 the idea of we're all in this together uh, and not to you know, stand on top of one another to save ourselves and push the other person down is uh, the approach that the Rav Achai is invoking. This idea that it's, in the fact that he talks about angels giving blessing, this is not Practical speaking, this is not practical halacha. This is aspirational value, and I think it comes from a, a, our parsha, which has in it a number of financial rules, including the prohibition against taking interest, uh, source number eleven, right? That you should do not exact advance or accrued interest, but fear your God, let your kin live by your side as such. Right? The whole idea of not charging interest is part of a. We want, everyone has to, everyone has to get along. Everyone is, we're, we're all in this together. And we're not going to talk about you know, workarounds to interest. We're not going to talk about Jewish banking and the like. I want to focus on the second half of that verse. A lot of, a, a lot of the rules of the marketplace within Judaism are motivated by we're all in this together. We all need to try and survive, and we need to help facilitate other people surviving. And I think this is expressed in uh, Gemara and Bava Metzia, which seems to have the opposite conclusion. This is a famous story uh, uh, of uh, this is a famous story of the uh, two people who are in the desert with one jug of water, right? So this is Rabbi Yochanan's. What, do, what does he do with our pasuk? Your brother shall live with you. He requires this for what I was just told in the Bryce. If two people were walking on a desolate path and there was a jug of water in the possession of one of them, and the situation was such that if both drink from the jug, both will die, as there's not enough water. But if only one of them drinks, he will reach a settled area. There's a dispute as to the halacha. Ben Ketorah taught it's preferable that both of them drink and die and let neither one of them see the death of the other. This was the accepted opinion until Rabbi Akiva came and taught that the verse states, and your brother shall live with you, indicating that your life takes precedence over the life of the other. So many, uh, uh, when we learn this piece of uh, this teaching of the Talmud, what stands out is that this is about chayecha kodmi, right? Your life takes precedence over someone else's life. And therefore, um, th therefore you drink the water and even if the other person has to die. I, I think that we can... We, we, we have to dig a little bit more deeply here and we see two things. Both Ben Petura and Rabbi Akiva are focusing on the Pasuk v'cheya imach. Right? For Ben Petura, right, you, 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 you're, you're, let your brother live with you means, you know, you can't do something that causes him to die. He can't do something that causes, him that causes you to die. Therefore, you both die. Right? You both can't live, so you both die. Right? Rabbi Akiva turns the focus on v'cheya imach right? Your brother shall live with you, right? He puts the emphasis on you have to live for your brother to live with you, so you have to live and you win. And so they're, they're both using this verse. The, uh, but also the fact that Ben Petorah's approach was the accepted rule until Rabbi Akiva came along and was able to counter it. And it just, this means both of them are going to suffer and die because being in it together is more significant. You know, that, that seemed to work and what seemed to be the accepted practice until Rabbi Akiva pointed out so, that some of the, maybe the, the, uh, the, 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 the illogical nature of both people dying when one could live. Uh, but, you know, from a, from a, from a practical uh, standpoint, but from, from an aspirational standpoint, we're all in this together in life, you know, till, you know or in death. And I think that, you know, that, that is um, more of a, a meta principle in all of this in terms of, Again, yes, you know, we have some halakhic guidance when it comes to hoarding and it comes to price gouging, and we have some you know, laws of uh, commerce that can hopefully uh, can direct the behavior. But let's face it, it doesn't really seem to control the marketplace unless it's more of a closed community that commits to doing so. And, um, you know, so the, 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 there's a higher purpose here that needs to be explored, says the Meiri. Midat chasidut, and I think that midat chasidut can be can emerge from the chayachicha imach, the fact that we're meant to really believe and, and and act as if we're all in this together, 
from a religious standpoint, from an aspirational standpoint. And look, even practically, we all go down together, really, you know, it, it is a compelling argument that Ben Pitura from, uh, offered and was followed. Um, and, and so, you know, we shouldn't immediately take the takeaway, we come first. Recognize we came first only after a, 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 a full uh, deep dive into the Pasuk, as well as following Ben Petura's uh, opinion for a while that both should die. And I think that should be the, 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 the attitude which shapes our approach uh, in situations like this. Uh, ready to take any questions or comments? Aluminum stocks have been bouncing again. Again, this is global. These move up. Aren't we taught, in, in, when we say in Kiddush, you take care of your own, you know, well, that, 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 you know, that, that's, not, that's not just our own. That's really a lot, a lot of people in that. Yes, process. but there's a progression or there's a way to do it. First, Correct. You, you expand. But it has to be, it has to, you know, on some level, you know, I think this means, you know what, everyone should uh, take the bare minimum they need. And if, this, if you're going to suffer, we're all going to suffer. Okay, so that's my next question. The bare minimum, let's say in formula, in my mind, uh, is yeah. three years of formula. Well, it's certainly year, that seems, uh, that certainly that seems halachically you can't you, certainly more than one year would be viewed as halachically inappropriate. Okay, so one year formula. Um, you know that, but you know then you also enter into that's you know you may be technically allowed to do, but is that the right is that the right is that the right attitude to have? Miyuri would say no. You know the the, the you know the Warhaftig would say no. Again, people will, people, people people reply with their. You know, with their own unique uh, fears, concerns, and desires. But you know, I'm just trying to put into a religious framework uh, th this type of a situation. I got it. I was adding the personal. No, for sure. You know, why three years? You know, if you're going to have a bunch well, of kids. Yeah, you know. I mean, Hanaka Tayeled. Right. Gamal, when does it take place? Yeah. To age two, age three. Exactly. Look, I think I think this 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 whole you know this whole situation has opened up all sorts of different things. People say, ah, this is proof that you, you, all, 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 they, all all children should be should uh, should be nursed, right? They wouldn't have this problem. You know, the, the, there's a lot of noise in the background, and there's a lot of you know, and there's a lot of individuals' concerns that will be a part of this. And we're, you know, I think that. Uh, you know the, the the role for religion or for, for for Judaism in this case is to give us a little bit of a perspective, and I and, 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 and I think and I think both the aspirational and the real politic are represented. The Miri says midas chasidus, and the Aruch Hashulchan says why should we be any more? Why should we be disadvantaged more than anybody else? Why you know why should we be why should we be holier than thou when everyone's you know reaching for the shelf? There was a Materna scandal in Israel a few years ago. That's the the, the simulac of Israel. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what was decided and what happened. I do remember that a lot of countries sub gave formula to Israel, mm -hmm. which took a few weeks here, <laughs> right, to come through. Well, but we'll see. We'll see how. We'll see what happens if it's still uh, in the headlines in the week ahead. But uh, okay. hopefully, all, all, all should all should be well. And uh, if anyone needs any formula in my, I have a, no, I don't have any. I've, no. um, uh, all but right. I Call me. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions or reactions? And uh, if I find, if anyone has good leads on uh, ways to stock up on gas, please let uh, Al know. <laughs>